My name is Neville Sanjana. I'm a biologist at New York University and the New York Genome Center, and I've been challenged today to teach one concept in five levels of increasing complexity. My topic is CRISPR. CRISPR is a new area of biomedical science that enables gene editing, and it's helping us understand the genetic basis of many diseases, like autism or cancer. I think today, everyone can leave with understanding something about CRISPR at some level. Hey, Tegan, do you know what we're here to talk about today? Science. We are here to talk about science. We're here to talk about something called CRISPR. Have you heard of that? No. CRISPR is a tool that scientists are using to edit or change genomes. Do you know what a genome is? No. It's kind of like an instruction manual. The instruction manual that makes you who you are. Sometimes there's mistakes in the instruction manual, like people get sick. Like allergies? Like allergies. Do you have, do you have friends at school that have allergies? Well, I have allergies with penicillin and azithromycin, they're a type of medicine. It's good that you actually know exactly what you're allergic to. For people that have really severe allergies, we could erase where in that, in that big instruction manual where they have those allergies and maybe make it so that they don't have those allergies anymore. Blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what CRISPR is? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> no okay. not at all. <laughs> CRISPR is a way to edit the genome. Do you know what a genome is? Yeah, it's the DNA. DNA is kind of um, the language that the genome is written in, and the genome itself is, is an instruction manual that describes how to make you, how tall you should be, what color hair you have, or what color eyes you have. So what CRISPR is, and an easy way to think about it, it's like a molecular pair of scissors that can go through that long, long genome and find specific places, make small cuts, and edit it. What do you think about being able to edit genomes? It's actually kind of cool, because then you could change, can't you technically change things about a person if you edit the DNA? Sure, so how do we determine what's, what's the right uses then? I don't think it should be used for almost cosmetology reasons, okay. or like for people <laughs> just to be like, oh, I want to be, five foot six instead of five foot four, or like reasons that aren't necessarily the most important. I just think if it could genuinely help someone, like if someone had cancer and there was a way to fix it, or like slow down the growth. So a lot of the work that we do in my lab is about being engineers of DNA. We try and look to see what mutations cause diseases, and to see if when we change those mutations, if we can take a sick cell or organism and make it healthy again. Couldn't you technically, because the P53, when it's defected, does, that's what causes cancer. P53 is the most common mutation in cancer. That's, yeah. that's right, yeah. That's a great idea, actually, to use CRISPR to target tumor cells and restore P53, to fix that, that mutation, so to make that cut with these scissors and fix it. Have you heard about CRISPR? Yes, this revolutionary gene editing tool. I know there have been uh, previous gene editing tools, but CRISPR is more revolutionary in that it's more precise and a little bit more affordable. Do you know how CRISPR works? So it works where you have this CRISPR, well, this Cas9 complex and... Protein, Cas9 yes, protein? Cas9 protein complex along with uh, something called a guide RNA. That's right, that's right. And that RNA will basically tell this protein where to go and what gene to sort of cut out. Right, and this is what makes the CRISPR system very programmable, is right. that the little piece of guide RNA is easy to make. Right. We can program CRISPR to go to many different places in mm -hmm. the genome quite easily. From but I've heard they're like close to almost curing muscular dystrophy with it. But there's a lot of, I guess, ethical issues that come up with it too. One of the really nice things actually about CRISPR is that we can use it in human cells. You know, if you ask most people, should you use it to cure cancer? Mo most people would say, yeah, those, those are, are good, good uses. But there are other areas that are a little bit more problematic, like editing the germline, right. which means something that um, could be passed on. Ethics-wise, a lot of people will have that natural reaction of fear against something new because it has a lot of potential and we just don't know where it can take us yet. It was sort of similar to like when people started doing in vitro fertilization. Test two babies. Test two babies. That was the Everyone kind was of scare term. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But now we see it's perfectly fine as long, you know, it's regulated and plenty of people. I know some people who came up from that. So there's been a lot of talk about using CRISPR for gene editing in humans, and that, that can be a controversial thing, I think, very naturally. There's many aspects of ethics that need to be looked at. 
Firstly, if we're talking about using CRISPR, are we using it in somatic cells, such as T cells, right. or are we using it in embryos or germ stem cells? And the issue with that is now you're modifying the genome at a germline level. Any unintended consequences could go forward many generations, you're saying with germline editing. Sure, there's unintended consequences, but there's also lack of consent. If right. you are... Not using... around, you can't consent. Exactly, right. so these future generations or products of CRISPR, they can't consent. Another, I think, ethical component is if CRISPR does make it to market, who will have access to it? Is it going to be cost prohibitive? Will only a certain select few be able to use it? As many new cancer drugs are today, right? Right, Will, will right. that be how it is, yeah. Would people start using it for non-therapeutic reasons? And I think this then can get into a whole slippery slope. So I think a lot of people are concerned maybe that CRISPR will be used in kind of frivolous ways. Maybe just to choose somebody's eye color or, or how tall they are or what color hair they have. And I think what a lot of people don't realize maybe is that the state of genetics is not quite there. It's nice to think that I can go in and choose exactly what eye color I want, but fundamentally, science doesn't exactly know all of that yet. We don't know every single gene related to eye color, nor the regulatory mechanisms, nor the epigenetics. This is a huge Right, so, so we can use CRISPR issue. now to try and understand better how do our genes relate to these, these different features, these different phenotypes that, that we have. There's a lot of work left to do before we even know, what, I think, what are the knobs and dials? What are the controls right. that you know, affect eye color or how tall you are? So I think this question right now, even though it's important to discuss, I kind of feel like it's more theoretical right now. Yeah, or is it really even a point necessary for conversation? Because people are going out every single day and getting plastic surgery to change how they look. How is this any different? And in the same slant, people are using in vitro fertilization, right? So this is manipulating genomes. You're choosing which embryos yeah. to implant. So we're almost doing little aspects of what CRISPR has the potential to do. So Matt, what are you doing right now in the lab and how are you using gene editing in your own work? Right now, one of the questions I've been very much interested in is trying to understand the effect of human genetic variation on using CRISPR-Cas9 reagents. Because you and I, just sitting here, differ in millions of different locations within our genome. We use these guide RNAs, which are 20 base pairs, and we match it to different places in the genome, but what if there's a mutation at that site? And how does that affect? A mutation that's different between you and me. It's the same site, but there's a slight difference in the DNA between you and exactly. me. Exactly. Let's say in you, it's a perfect match. And in me, there's one that's actually a mismatch. And how does that affect things in the lab? Because maybe it won't be as efficient. It won't be able to bring Cas9 to the correct site and cut there. So when, when people are using CRISPR now in the lab, are they really sequencing the exact cell type they use? sequencing, reading out the genome of that cell before they use CRISPR? Not many do that. It would ultimately be the best way to do it for sure because the reference genome that was published in 2001 was kind of just one person's genome. And as we know very well from sequencing many different individuals, there are a lot of differences. And so there are some concerns that when you use these in the lab that you're intending for a cut to be made in this one place in the genome. But if there happens to be a mismatch there because of some variant in the cells that you're studying, maybe it won't cut there at all. And even maybe worse is that maybe it'll cut somewhere else because maybe now it can match elsewhere. So, so you're saying right now that it's, it's kind of early days with CRISPR and that there's a lot of technical issues that really need to be ironed out, that it's not anything can be targeted at any time. We're trying to develop the scientific steps that will take us to that kind of total genome control. It is still the early days, and as much progress has been done, which is actually quite remarkable given how new this technology is. Yeah. I mean, we're just a few years away from when it was really started being used for these applications. However, having said that, it ha holds a lot of potential and I think can get there, but there's still a lot of issues and concerns that need to be worked out. I was going to say that a lot of what inspired me to get into um, bioengineering are, are movies, movies like uh, Jurassic Park. Um, which both shows the good and the bad sides of manipulating the nature around us. And so maybe it's a bit of a silly question, but what do you think in our lifetime will we see something like Jurassic Park where, where humans have actually engineered uh, different, different animals? Anything is possible. Uh, I'm not sure that we will see that in our lifetimes, but I would be very excited to attend Jurassic Park if that were the case. Having said that, I do think that CRISPR-Cas9 does have a lot of potential to 
two things that are kind of out of the box. In the past few years, we've been able to tackle ideas that people didn't even think were possible before that. More than anything, CRISPR has created a whole open field of opportunities. And so whether or not that leads us to Jurassic Park, I can't tell you that answer for sure, but I certainly hope that it does. <laughs> and I think you're right that the opportunities might be much broader than just biomedical science. It might be things like using DNA as a hard drive, being able to uh, use CRISPR as a diagnostic instead of just a tool for, for editing. Can we yeah, use cells to record data over time with, with CRISPR. Can we use CRISPR to track cells in a developing embryo? I think this is one of the most exciting recent uses of CRISPR I've seen that I would have never predicted uh, a year ago. The dominant paradigm right now is CRISPR is just for cutting DNA. But when you think of it more as a general platform, a pointer to a location in a genome, then that becomes a very, very powerful thing. Do you think CRISPR will be helpful for understanding human vari variation beyond what we already have just by sequencing people's genomes. Yes, absolutely. I think that the real power of CRISPR lets us to follow up on this genetic information that we've been studying and following for a very long time now. There have been a lot of studies where you take a group of people with disease X and people without that disease, and you see if any mutations seem to be preferentially in the group with the disease and kind of absent in the group without the disease. People have observed these differences, but what you're saying is exactly. with CRISPR, we can now test is this causal, this factor? Mm -hmm. If we make this mutation, does it cause the disease? Does it either create sickle cell anemia or ameliorate sickle cell anemia and, pre and prevent it? Do you think we'll, we'll be, ever be at a place where based on looking at someone's genome and these kinds of CRISPR functional screens, we can predict what kinds of diseases these people might get 10, 20 years in the future? I think that's certainly a great goal. As of now, we tend to focus on variants or mutations that we know the function. What about mutations we've never seen before? Something that comes from, let's say, UV radiation and melanoma or something? I think that we will ultimately have the power to do that. And so thinking about when you start from a mutation, do you look at the expression of RNA? Is that changed? Is it changing things at the protein level? So, so this is interesting. So you mentioned that we can analyze genomes, the DNA level, and then you said the RNA level, looking at the expression of genes, and then the proteins, the products that they actually make with proteomics or mass uh, uh, spectrometry. But do you think it's kind of like another level of understanding the function of the genome, or do you view it as part of one, one of those, those levels? I do think it provides a different level of data. The ability to rapidly and uh, genome-wide assess and make changes at the DNA level and then look at the resulting changes at the RNA and protein level I think is something that we haven't been able to do and is now I think going to rapidly advance understanding at a genetic level at the DNA level of a lot of different diseases. So, so you and I have done functional screens, we've done these large-scale CRISPR screens where we modify many genes, thousands of genes or thousands of locations in the genome all in kind of a test system but do you ever see this one day the idea of these multiplex pooled CRISPR screens going into the clinic, that we actually take a clinical cell line, a cell line from a patient. Absolutely. I think that is kind of one of the ultimate goals. Ultimately, it would be very nice to be able to correct the mutations for these diseases we've known about for sometimes hundreds of years and we just haven't been able to do anything about. There's a lot of kind of ethical issues surrounding very reasonably using CRISPR in the clinic. I think there's a lot of concern about trying to use CRISPR technology or other genome technologies to make humans designed in a specific way, whether you want to change eye color, height, or things like that. The kind of irony of that situation is that the genetics of a lot of the traits that are, you know, you can see by just looking at a person are quite complex and are not worked out in the same way. So, so you're saying that the ethical problem is not really right now a clear and present issue because for many of these um, perhaps a little bit more superficial traits that we have, we don't really even know what, what genes can control these, these traits, though it's probably uh, a good idea to start thinking a little bit about engineering somatic cells versus um, germline cells, which are passed on to, to future generations. And I think one nice thing is that most scientists agree that, for, at least for human gene editing, that we need to focus on somatic cells, where, which really impacts a lot of people with these diseases, and that there's many, many issues around editing the germline, where there you're um, doing something that may, might be inherited for, for many many generations. So it's, it's kind of an interesting misconception that people think that CRISPR is just one thing, just one enzyme, Cas9. I think that's a really great point, and that speaks to just how fast the technology is developing, because it started with us just knowing about Cas9, but in just- Just one Cas9, right? S. pyogenes Cas9 was kind of the first one used for gene editing in, in human cells. Exactly, and just in the past few years, this 
this toolbox has now been expanded well past that. For example, you can look into other different species of bacteria to find Cas9. So, so Cas9 is over many different species. It's over a tremendous amount of bacteria. And so you had referenced Strep pyogenes Cas9. Well, if they, you look into Staphylococcus aureus, you can also find Cas9. And that Cas9 is just slightly different. It can target different regions of the genome. And so that opens up a whole new set of possibilities in terms of genome editing. So it increases the targetable space within the human genome. You can target more regions that you couldn't with that first first Cas9. And, and what I find actually is a really interesting thing is that there's this huge metagenomic diversity of different CRISPR systems. And most of them are really just not even well characterized yet. And I think the best example of that we were talking about it earlier is this new RNA targeting CRISPR. So instead of cutting DNA, it targets RNA. And I think this is just one example of a complete paradigm shift. I don't think anyone had necessarily predicted at the beginning that this would be one of the things that just was created and existed in nature, and it just took some time for people to uncover it. I think it's a great, good example of why it's important, actually, to fund base, basic science, because you sometimes, when you start out down a certain path, you never know where you're going to end up in the end. The more research that can be done in this area can really unleash new possibilities, finding new things, different versions of Cas9, or other things that function like Cas9, or things completely different that at this moment I can't even think of. The possibilities are endless, to be a little cliche about it. No, literally, I think they are endless, for sure. I think it's great for people of all ages to understand CRISPR and at least a little bit about genome engineering, because so much of the world today revolves around biology. Also, there's something about self-understanding. We really uh, want to understand ourselves and what makes up ourselves. And CRISPR and gene editing is another way to get at what is the substance um, underlying us.